What in the world is a diamond architecture? Is this some elaborate marketing plot? Let's find out. Hey, you, Vlad here from devinsidey.com. Welcome to another video. In case you're new here, you should probably know that this is mostly a Scala channel. However, the topic for today is something that I have been obsessed with since the beginning of my software career, which was more than 15 years ago. So it's much bigger than Scala. In fact, it's the great mystery of the universe. Women. Wait, why women? Oh, is it because of the diamonds? Apologies. Sometimes my brain makes associations in very weird ways. This video is about architecture. Ah, now I remember. Architecture is not powerful enough. This video is about diamonds. Much better. All right, enough playing around. For many, many years, I have been really, really curious. I really, really wanted to know how to structure gigantic applications. And as a chair on top, I was also curious whether this structure would also be applicable for small applications. And I'm glad to report that it is, but everything has a cost. So for tiny applications, it it's probably not worth it. In any case, over the years, I have developed not only an architecture, but an entire design system from large drawings to even how to call your variables. And I keep fiddling around with it. So if I were to make this video a year from now, there would be some plot twists. So don't forget to subscribe. One day I will either create an entire online course or write a book about it. But there is a problem with this approach. See, after watching this video, you're going to want to implement it, but you will need buy-in from your peers because you can't do this alone. And it's very hard to convince them somebody to buy an entire online course or read an entire book, especially if they don't exist yet. And so this is where we're here. I believe that great architecture or in fact any other great thing should be simple. And so think of this video as an elevator pitch. When I wrote a script for this video, I was hoping for it to be only five minutes long, but I think it's gonna end up being around 15 minutes long, which is good enough. And also I'm gonna split it in two parts. So there's gonna be two 15 minutes long videos. So I believe half an hour is short enough to convince a coworker to watch. To make it short, I created a couple of slides. So let's jump right in right after the message from our sponsors, which is you or people like you. We're currently on the road to 500 patrons who collectively helped me pay for an editor. Instead of spending my time on editing videos, I'd rather concentrate on creating awesome content or hang out with you during live streams. In fact, I'm even considering to never start selling books or online courses. I haven't decided yet, but I have this voice in my head screaming that education should be free. I'll find something else to sell like t-shirts or maybe software software, you get the idea. Again, I haven't decided yet. There are many variables in play. In any case, thank you to all of my current and future patrons. I couldn't have done it without you. One more thing. Patreon started trusting me recently with another feature, which is the annual payment feature. And so for a very short period of time, for seven days to be more precise, if you're a new patron and you decide to pay annually, you get a 16% discount. And after this one week, it will slide down back to 7%. That's a big if you think about it. All right. To the slides. What is architecture? We could talk about it for days or I could copy paste some definition from Wikipedia, but we're kind of running out of time. So one bullet point should be enough. Uh, architecture is simply a guideline for managing dependencies, right? So it's not about infrastructure or tools or anything like this. It's just about managing dependencies. Now, depending on your technology stack, you might call them gems, jars, modules, submodules, projects, subprojects. Naming is hard. You get the idea. Let's move on. What is the goal of an architecture? And I'll be honest that I actually don't really know, but I do know what the goal of the diamond architecture is, and it is to optimize build times. And when I say optimize, I mean I want to have the fastest build times possible. And I mean this in the most technology agnostic way. As a reminder, this is the Scala channel. So for aesthetically typed language like Scala, I'm talking about compile times. But for a dynamically typed language like, for example, JavaScript, we're going to talk about build time. So from now on, whenever I say compile, I mean build. And whenever I say build, I mean compile, right? So I'm going to use these words interchangeably. Now, what is a good architecture? I think that a good architecture should be simple. And I will explain later what I mean by this, but essentially if it wasn't simple, people just wouldn't apply it. They wouldn't learn it if it was too complicated, if you would need like a 500 pages book about it. It should be technology agnostic, right? It would be kind of useless if it only worked for Scala, if it was some Scala specific feature. It should also be stack agnostic. So this video is not about something like functional programming or uh, any other pattern. 
uh, it should be scalable and I'm going to talk about this uh, in the next slide uh, but essentially we're talking about the size of the project and the cost and I have one point in red here called uh, no need to be universal and I don't believe that uh, architecture should be universal now, now with the diamond architecture you could build pretty much any kind of app uh, unless you know it's probably not it's probably not well suited for special use cases for something like uh, game development or library development or maybe something embedded I'm sure it could work for something small but that's not really what it's for so I get a slide over here about scalability because people throw around the word scalable all the time and so I want it to be a little bit more uh, concrete so this is a tiny graph right this is an exponential function this is a logarithmic function uh, we got time over here and we have lines of code over here and build time as well okay so essentially uh, if everything goes well with your company right then over time you're gonna keep hiring more and more developers and so your code base is just gonna keep growing and so the goal of the architecture over here is that the complexity the is that the you know the the build time function does not belong to the same complexity class as your you know code base size function okay ideally it should be like logarithmic but you know I've seen crazy code bases that I would even take linear at this point but it cannot like you know just follow um, the same way as the lines of code and by the way I'm 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 always concentrated about you know the build time but obviously you know when people think about architecture they also think about like maintainability of the code base but I actually thought about this for a very long time and I realized that build times are the biggest factor in maintainability right this is why you know everybody's talking about microservices right because if it's like a super tiny thing it's very very fast to build then it's very very easy to rewrite uh, obviously it's not like the only factor but it's like I, I realized that this is like the biggest factor if, if you can build something fast like in terms of like compile something fast then you can also maintain it fast. By the way, notice this uh, one tiny thing over here, right? So everything has a cost. So in the beginning or for, you know, for like really tiny projects, uh, this will sound like an overkill. This will sound like, uh, you know, seem like uh, an over-engineering because, uh, you know, it basically has a little bit of, a, of an upfront cost. I also have a slide about simplicity. I really wanted to be explicit about what does it mean to be simple and if you wanted to formalize the diamond architecture now it, you, you wouldn't really understand it if you're just looking at, at the formalization which is very typical formalized things it's basically only three rules everything depends on the core main depends on everything and all other dependencies are kept to the minimum and it's going to become clear in just a couple of seconds. I have something cool prepared for you. Now that we're on the same page, the solution is obviously the diamond architecture. Now, the first thing that we need to talk about is why is it called like this? Why is it called diamond architecture? Well, I realized that when you draw diagrams of it, then the boxes that represent the dependencies could be arranged in such a way that they form a diamond. Now, diamonds come in all shapes and sizes. Uh, I believe they're called cuts because they're stones, gemstones, pressure stones and uh, you cut them um, however we're talking about the diamond that you have been seeing uh, all this time in fact I have something really cool prepared for you and this is how it looks like and this is probably the ugliest diamond that you have ever seen but at least I can uh, you know turn it around and spin it you can think about it in terms of uh, layers and uh, in the beginning there is like three layers but I think it's more useful to think about them not as layers but more like a grid and you can position these layers as you please in the beginning you're gonna have three and honestly if you do everything properly you're pretty much gonna stay uh, with three uh, you, you you will only have like sub layers within the second layer but everything else like three should be enough okay so you have like some some big chunk at the top and i'm gonna say like what it is at the top and then you kind of have like like these ones right like these ones over here they're kind of like on the on the layer two we don't need this one like these guys they're kind of like on the layer two right and then at the very bottom you have the layer layer three over here right so every box is a is a dependency. You can think about it as uh, you know as a sub project or you know sub module or something like this. So I'm going to start naming these things, but it's very important that you understand that names are not as important um, as it is to decide with your team how you call those things. So for example, uh, like this thing at the top, okay, I'm going to call it core, uh, and the core contains the business logic, but I don't care how you call it. Okay, you can call it the main thing you can call it business logic doesn't matter agree on something with your team and move from there we're gonna call it core okay so the core is kind of like the only thing on the level one and it contains only the business logic and the most important part about this entire architecture that all the dependencies of all of these boxes they point to core so the core doesn't have any dependencies now this is a little bit 
idiomatic. There are obviously exceptions like what about the standard library? Uh, what about some like tiny utility libraries? You can have them just like minimize them as much as possible. Okay, ideally zero. A couple of things that I want to mention about the course. Sometimes it's not as straightforward to decide what is business logic and what isn't. And as a rule of thumb, if you can't think of putting it on a user story, it's probably not business logic. And if you keep thinking like this, then you will realize that your core is actually going to be really, really small, right? So if you wanted to make it actually a little bit better, like the core should be like sort of like this, right? It should be like a, the, the, the smallest uh, smallest component, the smallest um, the smallest subproject. But for now, because we want to maintain the shape of a diamond, uh, we're going to keep it like this. In fact, I'm going to move it up uh, a little bit uh, like like this, right? Because it's just going to be, you know, it's going to be easier to talk about it in, in, in terms of like three layers, okay? In fact, whatever, I'm going to make it a little bit smaller, okay? Like this, okay? But remember, it's supposed to be like a, like a diamond. This is also the reason why people don't like to write unit tests, right? Because unit tests, they test the business logic, but there's not that much to test, right? Usually it's something like, okay, if it's time to pay your employees, then pay your employees but like but where is like the algorithm or like where is like the database and all of this stuff like all of this a lot of this code lives over there and so people prefer to write integration tests these days there's actually a very good reason to keep the core very small and also to make sure that it doesn't have any other dependencies because it sits at the top and so none of any of this stuff can start compiling, can start building before the core finishes. So you want to keep the core as small as possible. In fact, I even found a way how to move the business logic out of the core in one of these guys just so that it compiles even faster. Essentially, you you kind of treat it as as a header, like in, in, in C. You know, you basically have only traits there and, you know, some types that are necessary to make the traits compile. And then you move the actual implementation into one of these boxes. So you have the core at the top, and we're going to skip this entire layer uh, for a little bit, and we're going to talk about this one. Again, you can think about it in terms of layers because all architectures have layers, okay? So uh, I'm going to call this one main, but again, you can decide however you want to call this. Uh, I heard people call it uh, add. Uh, dependency injection uh, entry point, something like this, doesn't really matter. I call it main. I call this one core, I call this one main, but you know, you do you. So there are only three things in the main. Uh, the actual main itself, which is basically like a one-liner, it calls your program. The program is also inside of the main, and the purpose of the program is to assemble the entire program, right? To assemble all of the use cases. And the third th thing that you have in your main is you have the dependency graph, the dependency injection of each individual use case, okay? So you assemble each individual use case on its own, then you have the program that takes all of them, puts them together, and then you have the main, which is just a one-liner, which calls something like run on your program. The main depends on literally everything. In fact, I believe I can do fancy annotations like this, okay? So there are arrows going out of here, right? So main has a dependency on everything because it needs to know uh, how to plug everything together, okay? So these are going to be very beautiful arrows, okay? Okay, and we haven't talked about the second layer yet, but I told you that main has a dependency on everything, which means that it also has a dependency on the core like this. I think that this arrow was ugly like that okay main has a dependency on everything core pretty much doesn't have any dependencies and again if you wish to look at it from the perspective of layers then the core is on the first layer and the main is on the third layer so we talked about the core which is kind of like on the first layer and we talked about the main which is kind of like on the third layer well what about everything else well everything else is in the middle well where, where else should it be right so it's on the layer two and we're going to call it the integration layer but actually not everything needs a name it's very important to realize that most of your code is actually going to be on on this layer right so on the on the layer two and so because we care about building fast uh the diamond architecture should target this layer very heavily Okay, and the way this works is that basically diamond, the diamond architecture demands that you create as many of these boxes as possible because essentially scalability, there's only two forms of it, right? We can scale up by getting a beefier machine, but there's limited called physics and you can scale out by compiling in parallel potentially on remote servers with caching and all of that stuff, but that's beyond the scope of this video. Essentially, the diamond architecture says create as many boxes as possible. And by the way, this is one of those things that uh, your colleagues are 
not going to necessarily agree with you, right? They're going to scream, oh, over-engineered. There are only two things that are important to understand about this layer. The first one is that the more boxes, the faster it compiles. And where does the speed come from? It comes from the fact that there should be no dependencies between those boxes. Like arrows like this should not exist. Now, there will be like super, super tiny exceptions, right? So for example, uh, let's say that this box talks to the Google Maps API via HTTP and uh, this box talks to the Stripe API via HTTP. So you might have some utils from time to time, so you might have like another box over here, and then this one would have a dependency on it, and this one will have a dependency on it. But there's gonna be like just two or three files, so it doesn't really count, right? So it's totally fine to have like a couple of like util uh, libraries, okay? And this is what I meant was like having like layers within the layers. Like I, I would consider like this whole thing to still be like in the layer two, okay? So uh, just, think about it as you have like only like three layers like this like this and like that and because this whole thing is starting to get ugly i'm going to remove all of that stuff like this the main has dependencies on everything and these boxes all of them have a dependency on the core it's kind of like this like all of these boxes have a dependency on the core and no dependencies between each other. When the core finishes compiling, right, it's going to be like one of the first things to compile, then it's going to be like a like a fork join kind of thing or like a scatter gather, right? So as soon as it's finished to compile, all of these are going to compile in parallel. And, and the more you have, the faster it's going to build. By the way, about this uh, util things, like if you think about it, technically they would be on the layer one because they will not have a dependency on core. And uh, so they will compile in parallel with the core. And so remember I said that, you know, don't think about it in terms of layers. Think about it in terms of a grid. So it's kind of fine. Like it's, it's totally fine to put something on layer one that kind of kind of feels like it doesn't belong there. Okay, but this is just a tiny detail. Just, you know, forget about it. Cool. So what exactly do we have on this second layer over here? And it's actually very interesting because uh, we have two kinds of boxes over there. Um, the one group of boxes, and I don't really know how to call them. We're going to call them red and uh, no, we're going to call them, we're going to call them blue and green because I have a couple of slides and I use these colors over there as well. So the blue things are going to be the ones that call the core and the green things are going to be the one that the core calls. It's the things that the core needs to function. And it's very important for two reasons. The first reason is that no matter who calls who, everything on the second layer depends on the core. The core never depends on anything from there, never. And the second reason why this is important is that these boxes are not distributed uniformly, right? So most of the time, you will have only one blue box, right? This is going to be the delivery mechanism of your application. For example, if this is a desktop application, the delivery mechanism could be the terminal, right? The user types something in, you call a method on the core. Okay, if this is an uh, Android or iPhone application, then uh, this is going to be, you know, the Android SDK uh, or, you know, the iPhone SDK, whatever it's called. Uh, if this is a backend application, then this could be an HTTP uh, server, for example. And if this is a, uh, you know, a client facing application on the web, then uh, this would be like the browser stuff, right? So this would be your JavaScript. This would be where, where your, you know, React is and whatever. Now, since this is mostly a Scala channel and uh, Scala as niche is mostly uh, backend web development. We're going to focus on this a little bit more. Uh, it's not uncommon to try to squeeze in a couple of other boxes that are not only responsible for the delivery portion of your application. For example, so let's say that this is a backend app, okay? And this is like the HTTP server part, right? So you have some HTTP library over there. It's not uncommon that you would also have something like, uh, like a scheduler, right? So um, HTTP calls your replication, calls the methods on the core of application, the scheduler ticks and then calls uh, methods on, on the core of your application. Uh, maybe you have some uh, message bus like Kafka or RabbitMQ or what you have, right? So whenever a message comes in, you call core, right? So HTTP requests come in, you call core. Kafka message comes in, you call core. A scheduler ticks, you call core. Maybe scheduler uh, also creates some sort of jobs and jobs from, you know, do some processing and they call a bunch of methods on core, right? So these are pretty much the only four examples that I could come up with. And uh, the diamond architecture is not going to stop you from squeezing all of them into the same 
diamond, but it is advisable to um, have, uh, you know, for example, for these four boxes to actually have uh, four different main methods and therefore you will have uh, four different diamonds, but you can do whatever, you know, whatever you need to do. It's not uncommon to have an HTTP server and also like a Kafka consumer. And by the way, this is just a consumer, right? Because we're talking about the things that call the core. Now let's talk about the other side. And this is the most important thing. This is exactly why we're here because look how many boxes are left and you should have as many as possible. The distribution should be like one to 99. Like most of the time you're going to have like just an HTTP server over here and maybe like a Kafka consumer and you're going to have like 99 other boxes. Right, like literally, like wh when was the last time that you have seen like a, um, you know, just like a web app, and that had like one hundred sub projects, and this is where the diamond architecture shines. It kind of encourages you to create those boxes. Now, where do those boxes come from? Like, how do you decide when to create a box? And the answer is very straightforward. And in fact, this answer will also uh, provide some guidelines for you how to how to name those boxes. And here's the answer: Anytime you add any new technology, any new library, essentially any new stack, create another box. Let's go back to the slides. I know it's a little bit overwhelming because all of a sudden we have a bunch of boxes, but essentially it's exactly the same diamond. So we have the core at the top and the main at the bottom and all the arrows point to core. This is very important. Okay. We have team blue over here and we have team green over here, right? So uh, this is exactly how I said, right? So let's say that we deliver the application somehow. Well, how? Well, via HTTP and we use some library for it. And so this is how you should call things. I mean, this is how I recommend that you call things, right? So what does it do? How does it do it? And, you know, what technology does it use for it? Okay. Then we also have a Kafka consumer with some library. We have some scheduler with, with some other library. We have some job processor with some other library. By the way, uh, when you're talking about scheduler, and job processors, I recommend to find ones that don't force you to use uh, static things or um, uh, or in Scala it would be like objects, right? It would be really good if you can construct those things uh, over here instead of just, you know, having them over here because if this is an object, it would be uh, not easy to inject uh, something from the core. And I don't want to get into details. Some people, uh, they don't have any traits in the core. They just have classes. And so it's not a big problem that, you know, a job would just, you know, call directly some class. But there are a lot of benefits from um, from having a trait over here. In fact, uh, one of the future slides, uh, like two slides from now, uh, will show you essentially we're going to leave only the traits here and we're going to have uh, core as one of these green boxes. Okay. So these green boxes are the most um, exciting ones, right? So essentially uh, you will have a bunch of traits in the core, they will be hidden from these guys, right? Because these, these ones, they will just call uh, methods on the core and they don't care how the core works. But the core will need all of these ones to work. And so all over here, uh, we're going to have implementations of uh, traits, right? And you're going to have as many traits as many of these green boxes you will have, depending on the use case, right? So if one use case uses only three of them, you're going to have only three traits. Another use case uses like five of them, you're going to have five traits. Basically, this is how you go about it. So let's say you need to store data, right? So you're going to have persistent right you can decide that you want to store your data on the DB and not on, on the disk or not you know in some other microservice right so you're going to call it DB which database Postgres which library some library one okay let's say later you want to start playing around with another library just create another box right persistence DB Postgres library two let's say at some point you want to read a config where, where are you going to read it from well from the file what library are you going to use library three Let's say you want to have part of your config, maybe you're migrating something, uh, you want to have part of your config in the database, let's say in the Mongo database, library four. By the way, if you wanted to load the config dynamically, uh, this would be the wrong place uh, to put it. Uh, like it dynamically means that it's basically the same as any other information. So it should be called persistence hyphen db hyphen mongo hyphen, you know, probably not live. Well, it could still be lib four. Okay, so then let's say that you want to call some external API, for example, the Google Maps API, right? Well, what technology are you going to use? Well, HTTP, which, which library? Library 5, right? So this is going to be the HTTP server, library 5. This is going to be the HTTP client. Now you're going to call Stripe, another box, external, Stripe, HTTP, same library, because it's an HTTP client, right? Then uh, let's say you're doing microservices, right? So you're going to do have an internal call to some accounting microservice, and this time it's not going to be HTTP, it's going to be gRPC, so you need another library, right? So it's going to be library 6. 
okay? And then also you have the Kafka producer, right? So the consumer's over here, right? Because the message comes in, you call something on the core. But then when the core needs to produce some messages, then it, it should be able to call something on some trait, and this is going to be the implementation. Now, I also have a slide on, was that example of a library, right? So over here, like this is HTTP, this is HTTP, this is HTTP. It's totally fine to have yet another thing, you know, and have a dependency on that thing. It's going to have only a couple of files. It's not really going to affect the build times. In fact, you're not even going to notice it because here's the thing. In the core, you're going to have, uh, well, it's, it should be like the smallest one, but it's not going to be like as small as this one. And because it, it's not going to have the dependency on the core, it's going to compile in parallel with the core. And so it's going to finish long before the core finishes compiling, right? Because these days you have like, what, 32 cores with 32 hyper threads, so 64 in total. So you're not even going to notice, okay? And by the way, occasionally you will have something, I don't know, maybe a trait that describes a logger inside of core. And this utility that we have over here is also going to require some logging. So occasionally you might also have an error over here like this, right? Occasionally it happens and then you cannot compile this thing until the core finishes compiling. But again, it's usually not a big deal because you're going to have only a couple of files over here. So it's, it's totally fine. Like, trust me, this thing is over-engineered enough. Don't over-engineer it even more. Keep it simple in terms of the layers, right? So core is layer one, main is level three, everything else is level two. And if you have something inside of level two, keep it very simple, right? Just like unite them somehow by putting utils into something and that's it, okay? And don't put things into the core just because you can, right? Because, oh, you might as well like put utils in the core and then you throw an HTTP library in the core. Please don't do that. I'll show it to you in the next video, but essentially whenever I create these, I actually assign um, assign numbers to the directories, not to the names of the sub project, but just numbers to the directories. So this is usually called uh, 01 core. This one is usually called 03 main. All of these ones are gonna be 02 hyphen. And I also started playing around with the idea of um, denoting the team blue and the team green. And I'm leaning towards using the letters I for input and O for output. So this one, for example, is going to be called 02 hyphen I because this is the input hyphen delivery HTTP lib5. And these ones are going to be 02 hyphen O because this is sort of like the output and then persistence to be. And also in the directory structure, uh, I comes before the O and you're going to have only a couple of these, right? Probably one or two. And you're going to have many of these. So it's going to be better visible because uh, you're going to have like many O's and, you know, the list is going to be very large, but you're going to know that at the very top you have your your eyes, your, your, your inputs. Now, I also have a slide, the one that I mentioned before, uh, how you basically can just keep only the traits and the data structures of the core uh, over here, right? So that, it, you know, we want to compile as fast as possible, okay? So I found another way how to like remove the business logic out of there, right? So essentially you have the trait here, the core moved over here. Right, and so now this thing can compile in parallel together with all of these guys and all of these guys, right? As soon as you compile your traits and some, in Scala, these would be case classes just to make your traits compile, everything else can compile in parallel. And when everything finishes, the main can start compiling. Now, I know what some of you are thinking. This is all fine and dandy for the new project, but I have a legacy project at work. How do I build this thing in there? And I've done this a couple of times in the past. And essentially, you probably have a ball of mud and it's very hard to shape it into this. And so the way you do this is you build it on top of your ball of mud. So essentially, your main is going to become the ball of mud. Or technically, it's the other way around. Your big ball of mud is going to become the new main. And so the new things you write with this on top and the old things, sometimes when you have time to refactor, you're going to gradually try to move them up. It's not going to be easy because way less things are going to be compiled, are going to compile within this architecture than, um, than in your big ball of mud because you probably have cycles, uh, your dependencies point into the wrong directions. For example, your business logic probably depends on your database, a very, very common thing. So it's going to be very, very hard. But over time, you can like at least partially move it up. Basically, start with like having only one thing over here. So let's say you have... Um, uh, you, you have an HTTP server and you have a Kafka consumer. In the beginning, put them into one, right? Put them into one blue thing, okay? And then let's say that, you know, over here, basically, you just have a database, right? And you're talking to some other microservices. Have it another one, right? So have just like, just three things, okay? Just have the core, have some way to deliver your application, have some way to persist your data or read the config or you know, send a message to another microservice or publish a, a Kafka message and then have your big ball of mud at the bottom. 
Okay. Also, I highly recommend that once you start this new thing, do it under a new namespace. Okay. So in Scala, these would be packages. So let's say you have, uh, you know, you're coming from com.netflix. Uh, I don't know. Do something like dev.netflix. You know, just 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 have like a completely different tree, different root. And there you have it. Create more boxes and have yourself some diamond architecture. I'm gonna see you in the next one, and I'm gonna show you how all of this looks at the code level instead of just at the blah blah level of drawings. For now, as always, it's from Vlad from devinsideyou.com. Don't forget to like this video if you did. Subscribe if you want to improve the developer inside you. And if you wish to support tech education, please consider doing so on GitHub sponsors or Patreon, whichever you prefer. And that's watch my videos weeks and sometimes even months before everyone else. And most importantly, take care.